A very good afternoon to one and all present here. I, Abhishek Hemrom, feel immense pleasure in introducing amongst us Mr. Robin Banerjee, the Managing Director of Caprihans India Limited earlier. Earlier, he has served in several multinational global corporations in senior leadership positions, including Hindustan Unilever General Manager, Arcelor Mittal Germany Managing Director and Chief Financial Officer, Thomas Cook Executive Director, SR Steel Executive Director, Sazlon Energy General Chief Financial Officer. Sir has worked both in India and abroad. He is a chartered accountant, cost accountant, company secretary, and MCOM. He is currently the chairman, finance and taxation committee of CII Maharashtra. He has authored several books on indirect tax subjects. Recently, he has authored a business nonfiction book titled Who Cheats and How? Scams, Fraud, and Dark Side of the Corporate World. Sir, we are highly privileged to have you here amongst us. Now, we would like you to enlighten us with your words of wisdom. Sir, the dice is all yours. Not required now. I'll tell you when to start. So not required now. I will tell you when to start. Okay, sure, sir. Presentation. Okay, sir. <coughs> Someone's mobile is lying here and it's ringing. Customer is calling. Oh, that's for the recording. The oh, that's a recording. Okay, sir. thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is fantastic. There are about 600 of you, which I presume most of you would be like to sleep now. <laughs> An afternoon after lovely lunch, who wants to hear who cheats aloud? My topic is very esoteric. This arises because I wrote a book, which is, looks like this. And... Um, This is uh, the only book of its kind in the world. There is no other book. There are uh, books on scams, specific scams, for instance, the Harshad Mehta scam or Satyam scam. But uh, in terms of corporate non-governance or ill-governance or corporate cheating, if I may say very bluntly, there is no overall book. I'm also aware that many of you are not finance professionals. And therefore, some discussions might sound a little non-interesting. And that's, of course, the time when you can actually go to sleep. Um, in order to start this topic, I have a presentation, um, structured one for you, which has um, lots of slides. Um, it all depends upon how much or what you want to see. But let me tell you some stories so that this whole world of corporate ill-governance or corporate cheating or corporate frauds become clearer to you. It's nice to listen to some stories and understand the concepts. Story number one. You are all aware that in 2008, there was a world recession. If you are not aware, it is better that you become aware, because you are business students, uh, students of business, 
And therefore, you should know in the recent past, how did the world behave? In 2008, the world collapsed. Why did it collapse? Why did the world collapse in 2008? It collapsed because of some misbehavior of some corporates. And that's the story which I'm going to tell you. In the year 2000, around that, United States of America had taken, or late 1900s, so late 2000 AD, 1990, 1980, 1990, 2000, that period of time, the political uh, leadership of US wanted to give every citizen of US a home. They said everyone must have a home, which is a very logical thing to have. If our prime minister or the government says everyone should have a home, that's the right thing to have. So what did US do? They encouraged the banks to give loans to people whoever wants to buy a house. So people with no ability to repay started borrowing and get a house. For instance, a sweeper, a driver, they bought houses worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, where banks clearly knew that based on the earning capacity of the sweeper or the driver or the loan taker, it will take perhaps more than 100 years for them to repay the loan. But still the loan was given. Whenever a loan is given for house buying, for instance, if you want to buy a car and you want to take a loan, what do the banks do you know? The bank will give you the loan, but the car will get hypothecated with the bank. That means the ownership of the car will remain with the bank till you repay the loan. Once you repay the loan, the ownership comes back to you. Should you not repay the loan, the bank then sells the car and recovers the balance portion of the loan. Same thing happened in US. They gave the loans on houses. The house was mortgaged. Uh, you people are businessmen, been students. I hope you know the dis distinction between mortgaging and hypothecation. Uh, mortgage is a product where the asset lies with someone, and hypothecation is something where the asset moves. You can actually use, for instance, the car. You can use the car, yet the car belongs to the bank, which is called hypothecation. A house is mortgaged because house is wherever it is lying, but you can use the house, of course. Now, so what they did is they gave loans, knowing fully well, many a times, that the loans will not be repaid. What was the logic? The logic was they were under the impression, or they thought, that the house prices are going up in the United States. In fact, if you look at from 1990, 1995 onwards, significantly increase of house prices were taking place. So the bank said that if I give a loan, and the borrower is not able to repay the loan, by that time the house price would have gone up. So I will then sell the house and make money. So if I would have given a $100 loan and the house is worth $110, by the time that fellow doesn't repay the loan, $100 house may have become $150 and I will be able to make money. So the whole edifice of banking loan was dependent upon housing prices going up and the understanding that if the house loans are not repaid, the banks will not lose money. Even non-finance people, I hope you understood, now the difficulty starts. The banks are intelligent people. They obviously had um, smart business graduates like you back working for the banks. So what it meant when the bank gave this loan, when the, when the bank gave this loan, um, the bank was, of course, sitting on a risk because the loan may or may not be repaid. Banks, of course, as you know, gives good loans. That means loans which will be repaid. There is a chance of repayment. And bad loans, like these housing loans, where the chances of repayment is very poor. These loans were known as subprime mortgage loans. If you are students of finance, uh, or even if you are not, it is good to know that the word called subprime mortgage loan. Subprime means it's not a prime property. 
the property which is mortgaged against which the loan is being given is subprime. It's not prime, it's subprime. So what happened is, these banks, young graduates or young business managers, they said, it's not good to give these loans where the recoverability is poor, so let's do something. What they did, and please try to understand, concentrate a bit, then you will be able to understand this difficult topic. What the bank did, they got the poorly financed loans, which is called the subprime mortgage loans. They took those loans. They also took the good loans, and they put those loans in a bucket, and they mixed it. Absolute khichri banaya with good loans and bad loans. And this so-called khichri, a mixture of good and bad loans, of course it had more bad loans than good loans, they called it, and for all students of finance, please understand there is a word called CDO. Have you heard of CDO? Collateralized debt obligations. This is called collateralized debt obligation. That means it was collateralized, it is a debt, obligation, but it was collateralized because it had a backup of houses or properties against which the loans were given. This khichri of loan, good loans and the bad loans, were then taken to rating agencies like Moody's and S&P's and they got rated. A rating agency rates the risk profile. They gave a triple A rating. Triple A rating means risk is very low, excellent loans, beautiful things, so they gave a triple A rated. Then what they did, you know, they had this CDO, they had this rating, and they went to an insurance company. And the largest insurance company to whom they went was AIG. And AIG was told, Mr. Insurance, will you kindly provide an insurance against possible loss? He said, of course, why not? So they gave her insurance. So this so-called CDO, a mixture of good loans and bad loans, incidentally, it had more bad loans than good loans. It had perhaps about 70-80% bad loans, about 20% good loans. So it was kachra, to tell you the least. It was worth almost a toilet paper. And uh, that was rated AAA. It was insured by companies like EIG. And then what the bank did, bank said, this is a nice little paper, a pot, which has a lot of loans, rated. Now let me sell the loan. So what they did, they sold the loans to other banks. So they passed on that CDO from their bank to other banks. So other banks bought this loan. Why did they buy the loan? Because loans had interest. That's the income they are going to get. Loans, of course, where the, the, the borrowers have, were supposed to pay interest. These banks, which structured it, and one of them was JP Morgan. It also included Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, uh, Citibank. All these banks were part of this deal. They, they then started selling the loan all over the world. It also came to India, by the way. Banks like ICICI Bank bought these loans. Then came 2007. This all happened in 1990, 95, 2001, 2, 3, 4. Come 2007. Some bank said, I have given the loans. Let me see if the loans are repaid. So some banks went and called the loans back based on, of course, the loan terms. When they started calling those loan banks, they found that the loan takers have no ability to pay. So they defaulted. When they defaulted, what did the bank do? Bank knows these loans are mortgaged. They're backed by, they're back, backed by homes, backed by properties. So the banks went and went. They said, Ali, no problem. Property prices are going up, so I will make a killing. So they went to the market to sell the properties. The moment they went to the market to sell the properties, the supply became higher, demand remaining same, prices fell. And the home prices in the US fell. The moment home prices fell, this so-called CDO, this kitchery of debt, both good debt and the bad debt, became worthless. So these banks, American banks, who sold these debts all over the world, these papers became worthless because the Borrowers have no ability to pay, and the borrowers, the assets which, they has, which is backing this so-called asset, CDO, also is worth almost nothing, and the whole banking system all over the world collapsed, and this happened in 2008, and that was the starting point, starting point 
a financial collapse of the world. Why? Because banks borrowed or got these investments in debt, and when they found that I have investments in products which are worth very less, they stopped giving for the loans. And if they stop giving for the loans, the industrial machine cannot move any forward because loans only fresh money. When the money comes, money goes out, and when this wheel keeps on rotating, the business progresses. They stopped giving loans, including ICICI for the matter in India. They said, oh, I'm holding so much investment which is worth nothing. I must stop giving new loans so that I can consolidate my balance sheet. Think, the first recession, or the biggest recession in the recent history came out from a corporate fraud. The banks, knowing fully well that the CDOs are worth nothing or have poor risks, they stole a very nice story around it and sold it all, over, all across the globe. And the result of the biggest recession, perhaps, in the world was due to a corporate fraud. This was story number one. I do admit that standing here in front of 700 of you, it is very difficult for me to ask questions, or you, if, if and if you wouldn't have understood, then to ask questions, but you are, I'm happy to answer questions as I proceed, because the degrees of difficulties may vary from time to time. So this was one corporate fraud which led to a disaster. Let me give you another story. My stories, which I'm now giving, ladies and gentlemen, please remember, these stories are, are on frauds done by corporates and how world changed because of those frauds. This is what I want to present first before I get into the presentation which I have in front of you. The second story, not in order of priority though. Have you heard of Enron? Enron. That's an energy company, huge energy company, multi-billion dollar energy company, United, uh, American energy company. They did a huge fraud in the year 2001. Enron was a big story. Everyone wants to work for Enron, deal with Enron, wants to buy shares of Enron, because Enron was growing, growing, growing. Enron was a typical story where the management, which is a CEO, CFO, and others, were continuously lying to everybody about the health of the business. One of the practices which they did is, Enron's one of the business, among several others, was to sell gas. And when you sell gas, when a company, engineering company or a gas company sells gas, when a gas is sold, it is sold for next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and then 10 or 20 or 30 years, the income will keep on coming. You sell the gas, the gas sale takes place on year one, and year two, year three, year four onwards, as you supply gas, you keep on getting income, which is logical. So in year two, year three, year four, as you sell gas, the income should come in, and the company should keep accounting for it. Now, this is a little accounting stuff, uh, and happy to explain to you later if you want. What Enron did, amongst the various other frauds, is that when Enron sold a gas contract, instead of taking into consideration, which is called accounting, for the each year's income in the respective years, on upfront, on year one, for the next 30 years' income, they took it as their income. Have you understood? So let us say they sold on a, um, a $10 million gas contract over a period of 30 years. That means every year, maybe they will get, let's say, $0.3 million. But, so every year, if they are going to get $0.3 million, they must account for or take into consideration $0.3 million income every year. But instead of doing that, they took upfront the $30 million, which they are likely to get for next 30 years income. This was absolute fraud. I hope you understand logically. Logically, it is incorrect, isn't it? So, what happened? Because of these fraud and other frauds, Enron in 2001 became bankrupt, and the fraud was caught. And when the fraud was caught, there are, they of course did many, many, many other frauds. And the implications of that Enron fraud was that when the Enron CEO 
was charged saying, you have done such fraud. He said, no, I didn't do it. My CFO did it. My finance guy did it. I have no knowledge. I'm a math engineer. Who? I have no knowledge. So therefore, what happened? The CEO of Enron proved or wanted to prove ignorance that the fraud happened and he knew anything about it. Of course he knew. By all means, such huge million to billion dollar frauds cannot take place unless the CEO, CFO, and others are aware of it. So there came a law in the US called sarbanes Oxley law. I don't know whether you have heard the sarbanes Oxley. All those, um, uh, even if you're not finance people, you should know that there is a law in the United States called sarbanes Oxley law. sarbanes Oxley Act, Act says that that when a balance sheet is signed and delivered, the CEO and CFO, both of them must sign saying that, in their opinion, there is no fraud inside the balance sheet. So, well, there are many other, there are many other legislations which came and requirements of corporate governance came into existence with Sarbanes Oxley. But one fraud, like Enron, changed the way companies are managed globally since 2001. And that's a second instance of a fraud. The first instance of a fraud changed the world when the banks misdirected or missold mortgage, mortgages. That changed the world. Recession came into existence, and we look at the banks now differently. And the second corporate fraud which is called, which brought into existence a corporate governance law called, called Sarbanes Oxley. By the way, after Sarbanes Oxley came into existence, Indian government under the Companies Act, the then 1956, now it is 2013, have also come out with corporate governance guidelines, especially for listed companies, which I am not getting into. This was a second fraud. I'll take, tell you the story of the third fraud. Have you heard of Satyam? Satyam, just imagine, Satyam means the truth. <laughs> Isn't it? So, true to its name, true to its name, because it tells the truth, they were doctoring their balance sheets. And one fine morning, Mr. Rangalingman Raju, who is the chairman of Satyam, came out and said that ladies, he actually wrote a letter to SEBI and copies to his board of directors saying that, gentlemen, in my balance sheet, I'm showing 5,000 crores of cash balance. Actually, I have none. He was showing 5,000 crores of cash balance. In reality, he had none. So he fudged. He was fudging the balance sheet. And he, on his own volition, came out and declared that I have cheated. What happened is, I'm not getting into this detail, but of course the auditors were hand in glove. Auditors did not check the cash balance appropriately. Those days, the concerned auditor was PwC. And the PwC auditors since then, of course, have been jailed. Ramalinga Raju himself have been jailed. But this fraud, where the chairman of the company and the board were misrepresenting their quality of balance sheet, this has changed the way by which India is going to run. And because of the Satyam fraud, and after it has come into existence, the government thought and found that the existing Companies Act is not good enough to catch fraud. So then came into existence something called Companies Act of 2013. There used to be Companies Act of 1956. Now you have a Companies Act of 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, Companies Act 2013 came into existence because of the story number three, which is corporate fraud by Satyam, computers. So just imagine how fraud changes the world. I'll tell you a fourth story. The fourth story is slightly different. Have you heard of Rand Yes, sir. Now, between 2001 and 2005, Ranbaxy, of course, was um, developing drugs, and they wanted to sell the developed drugs abroad, internationally. When you sell drugs internationally, you have to prove that your drugs work. Am I right? You have to prove that your drugs work. 
So obviously they used to do um, analysis of the drugs, they used to test it on human beings, but they found that drugs does not work. Especially the drug was Neurontin, this is a particular drug, which is for keeping, uh, for nerve control, for, to, to, to soothe in the nerves, one of the purpose of the, of the drug, it wasn't working. So what happened is, they fudged the data. The, the research reports were then changed such that the drugs actually passed the test. In reality, they did, it did not pass. In 2013, which is two years back, it was found out by the USDFD authorities, and the company has been fined half a billion dollar, and the company has indeed said that, yes, I cheated. What has happened after that? After the US and European authorities have found that a company like Ranbaxy, Ranbaxy could doctor the research reports, what about other companies? Maybe they are also doctoring their research reports. They are also doctoring their findings. So now, as I talk to you, the exports out of many pharmaceutical companies have got affected because there are now significant doubts which the international customers are raising on Indian drug manufacturers saying, perhaps everything is not okay. Had Ranbaxy not happened, and had they not done this fraudulent activity, India's pharmaceutical exports would have actually started going up. Just for information, there are two products which India's exports have been on the rise. One is software, number two is pharmaceutical. As it stands today, the pharma exports are going down. Perhaps one of the reasons is my story number four of how the reports were doctored. Now, I have told you four stories. Story number one, how the recession, world recession came into existence because of a corporate fraud by banks. Story number two, how a company sold and mis uh, misrepresented their balance sheet and Enron came into existence. The corporate governance law of the world changed. Story number three, Companies Act 2013 came into existence because Satyam fraud was so significant, India did not know how to catch, if it happens again, how to penalize the perpetrators. And the story number four, when a pharma company did not perhaps keep the light, right re re registers and records, and they found maybe other companies are do also doing something wrong. Any questions till now? I do understand that to raise a hand at a juncture when none of you are raising, it is perhaps a harakiri. Um, it's, it's needless to state that all these stories are all here, of course. goes without saying that. So, JP Bongan. I will now take you through. I do know some of you are sleeping. It's not that I can't see. But it's nice, nice to sleep in a nice air conditioned room. <laughs> and when um, corporate cheating has been discussed, which many of you have no interest whatsoever, that's perfectly all right. But let me tell you, this is an area which is not discussed. It's an area which is not taught but an area which will affect each one of you sitting in this room, each one of you. So if you can understand how things can get wrong or things does go wrong, it's much easier to solve and resolve those issues. There is another a uh, positive effect of this talk is that if you know how corporate frauds take place, if you know that, 
your understanding of that concept becomes much clearer. And maybe as I go through, I will tell you certain instances where should you understand how a fraud took place, you will also understand the concept behind it. Um, cheating is sometimes very irresistible to many people. A lot of, lot of people think, feel that cheating is what I must do. Uh, is that clear there? No. Okay. Good. It's okay. Um, I'm not to show whether you know that even most famous people who are our, whom we follow like a dream, they also cheat. Tiger Woods cheated in the 2013 Masters. When the television was on, he was live on TV, he was playing his um, golf, and he shifted his ball. You are perhaps not aware that there are, there are nine individuals in the world who have actually ran the 100 meters at less than 9.8 seconds. Nine individuals ever ran 100 meters less than 9.8 seconds, of which six cheated. All six have got caught since then, otherwise I wouldn't have known that they cheated. Of course, a lot of people cheat. Now the latest is the International Committee, like Olympics, uh, the FIFA cheated. I'm not getting into why do people cheat, but some cheats because no one is watching. If no one is watching, why don't I little cheat and make some little side gains? Some cheat because others are cheating. Think of an examination. You are sitting and appearing, you are very honest, but you find your neighbor cheating. And of course, he or she is going to get more marks. So why wouldn't you? Isn't it? So we cheat because others are cheating. Third, there are some cheats who are habitual cheaters. They love cheating. <laughs> the president of Italy, Mr. Berlusconi, have you heard of him? Yes. He loves cheating. Cheating of every type. You open the internet and you will find what all he has cheated in. He's a habitual cheater. Some cheats because they have nothing else to do. Because that's what they do. For instance, cheating could be corruption, bribery, killing, terrorism. All these are cheating. Something which is not in the corporate, not normal, normal uh, human behavior, that's cheating. So, just think of... Um, the, in the Andhra Pradesh or Orissa, portions of that, um, as you know, one-fifth of India is under Naxal control. And these Naxalites controlling what? They are controlling the wealth of the country, the, the iron ore and the coal which is under the ground. They are doing that because they have nothing else to do. So therefore, they are doing terrorism to earn a living. So some cheat, of course, um, Greatest example is Somalia pilots. The, uh, presumably, large portions of the country, they are all pirates because they have nothing else to do, so they pirate ships. What is, the, what is the most important area when we talk about why does corporate fraud take place? Now, today, our talk is on frauds, that's true, but on corporate frauds. All of you will take a job. Some of you will take a job. Some of you will start your own startup. Some of you will join your father's or parents or uh, family business. You will all be in business either as a worker or as an employee or, or an owner. You can perhaps cheat. And if you do or if someone does cheat, why does anybody in corporates cheat? There is one word called greed. It's because of the greed people cheat in the corporate world. That's the main reason why they cheat. Of course, there are people who cheat because others are cheating. There are people who are doing cheating because that's the only way they can enhance value and so on and so forth. Globally, globally, just for your information, 5% of the global turnover is subjected to corporate fraud. Now, if you are, if you are students of business, which you, all of you are, and you join an organization, there is a chance that if you are joining an organization which has 500 crore turnover, there is a possibility that 5% of that, some corners are getting cut. Globally, 
5% of the global's turnover is subject to corporate fraud. Who is a typical cheater? Who is it? Normally, in an organization, a person, a person who is the most trusted of employee cheats. Because a person who is very trusted has been given the authority and the power. He or she is not questioned. And therefore, they have, they get the passport to cheat. Again, by research they have found, normally they are middle-aged, between 35 and 45 years of age. Most of the corporate frauds are asset misappropriation, which means that theft, it means theft, is the most common corporate theft, corporate fraud. Um, you will be surprised to know the last point which is mentioned here is 70% of the companies, 70% of the companies all over the world is subjected to some cheating or the other. 5% of global turnover is fraudulent and 70% of all the companies in the world, there is a corporate fraud. Just imagine, all of you are going to work somewhere or join an organization or join a company you, are so, you will be so much exposed to corporate frauds. And therefore, it is very important for all of us to know what happens, who does it, what we need to do to make it, to prevent it. This I will not get into. This is just an excerpt from the book. Um, what is the most common fraud? The most common fraud is theft. That is number one. Number two is procurement fraud. Procurement fraud means the purchase department procures or purchases things at a higher price. That's a procurement fraud. Third is corruption. That's the largest, third largest corruption, of course, is bribery in some form. All those who are accountants here, please understand the fourth largest fraud is accounting fraud. That means the balance sheet and profit and loss account based on which you are exercising your opinion or you are taking a view on an organization is doctored. And that is a very serious issue because if you are looking at a balance sheet, which I presume many of you would have gone through a balance sheet of a company, I hope all of you have in, in your studies. Just imagine if they're doctored, your, your conclusions drawn will be incorrect. And the fifth, which is now growing mammothly, is cybercrime. Nothing. Nothing, there is no computer system in the world which is unhackable. Please remember, there is nothing in the world which is unhackable. Anything and everything is hackable. And therefore, each one of us, including the countries in which we live, including the energy system, the power system, the aircraft which is going, the railway system, everything, if it is hacked, they will all collapse. The biggest risk in the world today is hacking. And that's although today in the corporate world is the fifth largest, but the non-corporate world, it is now going through the biggest risk. Especially when there is so much of terrorism around, they obviously want to affect the country and they can do it by hacking, uh, by stopping the electricity of a city or stopping the water from flowing or stopping the aircraft engines from working. I hope you know that if you have a heart implant, even heart implant can be stopped by a hacker. Just imagine where this world is moving into. Um, the, the, the size of frauds, um, huge. The average in Asia Pacific, in Asia Pacific is $1.5 million, which means on an average between 8 to 10 crores in average size of fraud. When fraud takes place, it happens large size. Why? Why does it take, have, happen in a large size? Because whoever is a fraudster, they know, if I have to cheat, if I have to steal, and if I get caught, I might as well do a large number. So even if I get caught, it doesn't really matter. It's called the risk and reward. So if I'm taking a risk of getting, getting caught, I might as well do something which is very large. The bad news is, it takes almost three and a half years to catch a corporate fraud. It takes almost three and a half years. The problem more is, in countries like India, it takes five years to catch a fraud. That means, if a fraud is taking place today in a company, 
five years later we will catch it. Or if something has come to your, your eyes today, or if it's something you have noticed today, the chances are that, you, that fraud was committed five years back. So that's the bad news. That's a very, very bad news, but yes, that's truth. Um, corporate charlatan means corporate cheaters. Um, what can happen is I'll give you a small example. I'm not too sure whether you have heard there is a BP oil leak. British Petroleum, have you, have you heard of an oil leak? In this company, they have paid the largest ever fine, $21 billion, $1 billion means 6,000 crore. This company has paid a penalty of $21 billion. What did they do? To cut the long story short, they were extracting oil from Gulf of Mexico. And when they were extracting the oil from Gulf of Mexico, they knew that the, that the, that the uh, pipeline is weak and it can leak. But in order for their greed to get more oil, they did not take cognizance of the fact that the oil rigs can leak. So they did not repair the oil rig. And obviously what happened is thousands and thousands of um, land was full of oil. People died and animals died and the fish died and the government had to place on them a $21 billion fine. Complete corporate cheating. They knew that oil would leak. They knew that needs to be repaired. Perhaps it should have, they would have taken a two or three days or four days shutdown, but they did not do it because of their greed of taking more oil out, more oil out from Gulf of Mexico. Um, just imagine, bribery is a, is a corporate cheating. Just see who all have cheated. Daimler, Siemens, Walmart, Oracle. All of them have bribed and all of them have got caught and just see the names, the names which you believe are beyond and above all uh, or, or, the, or the ultimate of good corporate governance. I shall not get into something called a Colgate scandal and in India there's a 2G scandal. Um, these, are, these are scandals which has happened in India. You may have noticed in, you may have noticed in the newspapers, but just to tell you one story of this, what happened in the 2G scandal is that um, the government was giving away the, uh, the 2G licenses, spectrum licenses. The government was giving away spectrum licenses. And there was a rule that whoever, whoever will quote highest will get the money. But overnight, the, the previous, let us say the, the night, the day on which the license is to be given, the previous day, the political, political leadership at those particular time announced that license will be given whoever reaches the office first. Just imagine. I will give a license to whoever reaches the office first. License should not be given to whoever reaches the office first. License should be given to whoever quotes highest or whoever gives me the price I want. So they changed the rule, they changed the law. And uh, Mr. Raja, who was then the then telecom minister, was jailed, as you know. And uh, therefore, that is how the telecom scam came into existence. The government of India auditor says one lakh eighty-two thousand crore, or one lakh eighty thousand crore, was lost. But just imagine, by changing the rule of the game, how the government lost money, and of course, the 2G scam took place. Same thing happened for the coal, coal skate scam. Coal gate scam also, when the coal scam took place, also the country lost about 1,80,000 crore. Uh, it is stated that the licenses of coal, the coal mines were given, were supposed to be given to companies who have minimum qualifications. Many companies fudged the data. They fudged. And the government knew that the data is fudged, but based on applications filed, which was fudged, licenses were given, and of course, then came into existence the so-called coal scam. Um, theft. SAP stole. Can you see that? SAP has stolen software from Oracle. It is, it is not my dream. These are all um, proven, proven cases of corporate frauds where 
the companies have accepted, yes, I've done wrong, and most cases, they've actually paid fines. Of course, details are all in the book. Hilton Hotels stole from Starwood Hotels documents, and MF Global, you may not have heard, they stole customer funds. It's a mutual fund company. They stole the funds from the customers who were investing in that, in that company. Uh, many of you are, who are finance guys, you know that you must pay the tax on the right time. There are lists of companies who avoid tax. Now, is tax avoidance a tax planning? It's a million dollar question. But just imagine Apple, Google, Amazon, G Capital, Starbucks, all of them. They're all, as it stands today when I'm talking to you, they pay piddly little tax. They structure their business such and such, in such a way they don't need to pay tax. How they do it, if you want to know, of course, it's, it's in the book. Um, but yes, this is corporate cheating in some form. Uh, there is food fraud. You may not have heard that uh, I'll take the last example, which is called Beach Nuts. Beach Nut is a Swedish company which makes uh, drinks for child, child drinks. This company was selling apple juice for child, for children, for, for toddlers. Can you beat it? In order to sell their apple juice, their peach nuts apple juice, which is perhaps one of the second largest food company in the world, they had only sugar and did not have even one drop of apple juice. What a cheating. They were cheating the toddlers, the children. So sometimes the corporate greed becomes so, so profound that even companies like, famous companies like Beach Nuts have done things which are unimaginable. Next, try to get into banks. There are loads of banking issues. Um, there was a study done by Edelman in 26 countries, and they found that out of 26 countries, 20 countries of the world don't trust banks anymore. Dangerous. Banks is where your and my savings are. But if you stop trusting them, then that's very dangerous because banks have started, have cut corners, made money, and of course they don't uh, trust banks anymore. Um, yes, this is it. Globally, half of, the, half of the mankind don't trust banks, and there are too many scandals in the banks. Um, banks uh, have, uh, you must have heard, LIBOR scandal, money laundering scandal, the third one, which is the mortgage-backed securities, is the first e example I gave today. Um, these are all scandals, LIBOR scandal, LIBOR, have you heard of LIBOR? London Interbank Rate, the interest rates. And the banks is to come together and fiddle with the rates so that people who are taking money, money borrowing money, will be paying the wrong interest rates. Just imagine, they knew that they are fiddling with it, they knew they are lying, and still they did it, and of course, just imagine the banks which did it, Barclays, UBS, Rabo, RBS, Citi, JP Morgan, Deutsche, you name a bank, and they've all committed huge frauds, huge money laundering. Can you beat it? In money laundering, there is a bank called Vatican Bank. They also do money laundering. So if God's own banks cheats, who are minor human beings like you and me. Um, there are frauds inside the bank sometimes, which is called frauds in banks, which means there are traders who does hanky-panky and loots the bank. Um, these are called rogue traders. I wouldn't get, not get into it. There are frauds on the banks. For instance, debit credit card frauds, as you know. A very um, common fraud today is phishing. You know what is phishing? You are all, in, you are all students, so some of you would have worked. Some of you would have worked in... You would have, many of you would have worked in your summer's internship. So let us say you go to a company and you are, you are um, sending an email. And suddenly, you get a mail, a mail from your boss saying that, uh, why don't you give such and such details? Or maybe a mail comes from your father saying that, you know, I'm in distress, I want your credit card number. Phishing is a concept by which someone is trying to fish for your personal data. So there would be credible looking emails and that email would actually be looking for more information. Um, have you, this is, the, this, is, this is the quick rich financing scheme, have you heard of Ponzi scheme? 
Have you heard a Ponzi scheme? If you have not, and I presume most of you would not have heard a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi scheme is very, very serious issue. Please be aware of the fraud which is going on and many of you or some of you would already have been exposed to it. It goes like this, that someone will come and tell you, a friend of yours, usually this is a friend, and person whom you trust will come and tell you that there is a company who is taking deposits. If you give them 10,000 rupees deposit, they will give you 30% interest. You will say, wow, 30% interest? That's fantastic. If I pay 10,000 rupees, I'll get 3,000 rupees per annum. That's fantastic investment. So you will ask that friend, Are, have you invested? He said, of course. Have you got 30,000, 30%? He said, yes, I've got it. You know what they do? The way Ponzi scheme works is that let's say I, I get the money from him and I get 10,000 rupees from Mr. A. I take it. I'm supposed to pay 3,000 rupees interest to him, to Mr. A. And of course, I have no business. There is no business. This is all scam. It's complete scam. Then what I do, please try to understand. I go to Mr. B and ask for another 10,000 rupees deposit. When Mr. Give, B gives me 10,000, from that Mr. B's 10,000, I pay to Mr. A that 3,000 rupees interest. So A is satisfied. A knows, yes, I have got my interest of 3,000 rupees. Now I go, I have to pay Mr. B. I have no money. Then I go to Mr. C. Mr. C, I take another 10,000 rupees and pay that 3,000 rupees interest to Mr. B. So I keep on taking money from someone and pay the earlier people and keep on paying, paying the earlier people. This lasts as long as I get new bakra. I get new idiots. I get new people who are willing to give me money. Have you heard of Speak Asia? Many of you have heard of Speak Asia? Latest is Sharda scam in West Bengal. These are all Ponzi schemes. Sharda scam, Sharda, uh, realtors, they say that the money which you are investing, I am buying land. Land price will go up and you will be able to sell land. You will have to be able to make money. Speak Asia, very simple. Speak Asia said, you come, <coughs> you come to me, you have to fill up a form. Once you fill up a form, I'll give you money. And that form is nothing else but some, how a product works, your television works, some innocuous looking forms. So obviously they will give you a story. You will get credible information that someone is getting the money. But please be aware. There are Ponzi scheme all around. As I am talking to you, as you people are listening, there is a Ponzi scheme going around somewhere near you. Uh, by the way, Robin Hood was a Ponzi scheme, sort of, because you know he used to kill the rich to pay the poor. And as long as he was killing a rich, he used to pay the poor. And many of these uh, so-called heroes who are doing a lot of charity by killing, killing Rich people, so-called rich people, it's a Ponzi scheme because as long as they can kill a rich person, they can pay the poor. There is no business behind it. There is no, there is no concept or structure behind it. You are students of business, so <clears throat> while <coughs> I discuss Ponzi scheme, but please also remember, apart from Ponzi scheme, which is a complete fraud, complete fraud on all of you, all of us, there is something called a pyramid scheme. Pyramid scheme is something like this. Have you heard of Tupperware? Yes. Tupperware getting sold? How does Tupperware get sold? That if I am a Tupperware agent, I appoint someone else who has to buy Tupperware from me, who has to buy Tupperware from me, and then he or she has to sell Tupperware to new people. Then again, he or she will appoint new agents who has to buy Tupperware from that person. But Tupperware sale is a genuine business concept. What people have done, they have tweaked this product and said that you don't need to sell to anybody, you just sell to yourself. That means I appoint someone who has to buy, let's say, uh, utensils from me, then he has to sell it to somebody else who will become his agent or her agent. So the sales is between from one agent to another agent, there is no sale in the outside world and that's called a pyramid scheme. Beware, beware that there are genuine sales transactions, genuine looking transaction which is going on in the world, which actually looks, it is a pyramid scheme. There is no sales behind it. So Ponzi scheme and pyramid scheme, it is very important that all of you are aware of it. Stock market swindles, that's I am not talking to you about. That happens almost 
almost regularly. Uh, there are big names. Harshad Mehta scam was something which you must have heard. Uh, Rajat Gupta, have you heard? Uh, that's called insider trading. What is insider trading? Insider trading is somebody has insider information and then deals with shares. I can understand all of you are getting very jittery. There's a lot of talking going around. Um, so it is, um, it is 50 minutes, so I'll take another five, seven minutes if I may wrap up quickly. I can see that uh, inconsistencies have brought in to, your, to yourselves. So uh, crime in the wire world, um, as I told you, nothing is unhackable. Um, be careful. The future, there is a huge future risk on um, crime in the cyber, cyber, cyber site, cyber, cyber crime. Um, that's, that's a huge one which is likely to happen. Uh, most of the cyber crimes are emanating from Eastern Europe. It's also emanating from China, Iran, and Korea. So be careful. Uh, the huge one, and I'm not going to get into it, is accounting cheating. And there are several ways by which, by which an accounting fraud can take place. What is an accounting fraud in one or two sentences? If I have a balance sheet of a company, I'm showing a particular sale, If I have a balance sheet, I have to put showing or profit and loss account showing a particular sale, and then sale is completely manipulated. My assets are not there, assets is manipulated, stock is manipulated, debtors are manipulated, sales is manipulated. This is the way manipulations can be undertaken. It's in the book. Uh, there are more than 100 instances with absolute live examples, but kindly see the list. Who, have all, who all have done accounting fraud? Xerox. IBM, Coca-Cola, G, Reebok, Dell, Microsoft, Satyam, of course. So you can obviously see the best of names of the world, they've all done corporate cheating to accounting frauds. It's all examples where they have been caught. <clears throat> I shall quickly run through the types of accounting frauds and not get into this. Um, there is... Um, there is one, I gave you an example of Ranbax, if you remember. This is a very, um, very pitiable subject. When you buy a drug, when you buy a drug given by a doctor, you presume that the, the doctors have given a drug which will work. You will be surprised to know that very large companies have sold drugs which they knew does not work, or they knew has such side effects, you should not have used it. I'll give you an example. It's a pathetic example. This is a pathetic uh, st uh, story. There is a company called Grunenthal. It's a German company. It gave <clears throat> a medicine to pregnant ladies for, for of course, keeping her well-being. And whoever has taken this Grunenthal medicine have given birth to children without arms and legs. Can you see? She has no arms, she has no legs. And this company did it for 50 years, 5-0, ladies and gentlemen. It's a German company manufacturing and selling a drug called thalidomide. If any one of your friends who is doing medicine or studying pharma, please ask what is the story on thalidomide, and they will tell you the gory story and gory story of how they knew it. The company knew it. They have been fined now in 2012. They apologized. But just imagine what value subtraction they have done to, to the society. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen. What it looks outside, like a tepid water, water without much of a hassle, there are huge undercurrents of this corporate world. I shall not take you other stories. Because there are many more, including, um, including uh, a company called Allegran. I don't know whether you know Allegran. Allegran, Allegran is the one who produces and sells Botox. You people are young, so you don't need Botox treatment. We are very old people, so we may, many of us need Botox treatment. And Botox was sold. This is a wrinkle, killer, wrinkle curer, of course, primarily wrinkle curer. curer. And Botox was sold by Allergan as a migraine headache killer, migraine curer, knowing fully well 
Botox has nothing to do with it. <clears throat> they were then fined. A company like that, nowadays you must have seen in the newspaper that Pfizer is trying to take over this company for some $160 billion transaction, but that's uh, elegant for you. I shall not get into other examples because there are many. Um, human tests are not done and drugs are launched for human people. Drugs are launched without doing appropriate trials. <coughs> so having said all that, if I may summarize, one sentence is that, ladies and gentlemen, please note, the matter of corporate fraud is not going to end. Just because a thief, just because a thief was jailed, another person will not stop stealing. They know that if I, if I steal, if I get caught, I will be hanged. So does corporate people know that if I get found, I shall be fined, my name will be everywhere, I shall be discredited. But still, people, because of their greed, they would still cut corners. The answer to this all this is, be aware, be careful, be knowledgeable, know where all things can go wrong, and you shall be much, much better off. This book has more than 450 examples, live examples. Uh, and if you ever get a chance, your institute has several copies. Um, it would be wonderful for you to know what can go wrong and how you need to be taken care of for the future. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Happy to take all the questions. It is 4, 4, 3.45 to be sharp. <laughs>